Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of ECIA, welcome to this webinar about the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on the internal audit profession in the banking sector. Uh, for those who do not know ECIA yet, so ECIA represents 34 national institutes of internal auditing in Europe, more than 55,000 internal auditors, and the mission of ECIA is to be the consolidated voice for the profession of internal audit in Europe and promote good corporate governance towards the European uh, regulator. Before going to the discussion of today, let me please share with you some logistic details. So we will use Slido for the questions for the polls, but also for the CPE. So I'm coming back on this one in two seconds. The event will be recorded and we will send with you, uh, send to you, sorry, the recording uh, next week together with the key messages so that you can share them with your colleagues. If you would like to receive a CPE certificate for this webinar, please uh, go to the Slido application where you will find the CPE form request. Please do it right now or at the end of the webinar where we will keep Slido open to give you some time to fill in the document. So now let's start with the important aspect of the discussion and let me introduce you the facilitator for the discussion today. So Claudio Testa. Claudio is a chief audit executive of Sao Paulo in Italy, but he's also a very active member of the ECIA Banking Committee with other colleagues. He is helping us uh, reviewing the new regulation, analyzing the impact and advising colleagues about what does it mean for the profession. So thank you very much to you, Claudio, and also to the other colleagues to be with us today. And the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Pascal. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me say that uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. Uh, at the beginning of uh, this year, probably no one around this table uh, thought that uh, such a situation we would have uh, uh, faced. The crisis uh, absolutely was not expected, but uh, uh, here we are. And so we is very is very clear, very uh, right. The, the the title of this webinar, the challenges. Uh, for for us uh, from uh, this uh, uh, cr crisis. Uh, let me say first of all that uh, I have a, a, a quite long experience in internal audit, uh, and um, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, during a, a, a crisis, it's very important that uh, internal audit uh, um, is part uh, of uh, the crisis unit, uh, uh, the crisis management unit. Um, OK, it's important that we uh, attend, the, the attend the meetings of uh, the, 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 the crisis unit. Uh, uh, OK, for sure, we don't take any decision. We are not part of the votation, uh, but uh, we need to, uh, to stay in the, the crisis uh, management unit in order to, to be permanently updated on, on what is happening in order to assess the risks, to be able to evaluate if all the situations are appropriately managed, um, if uh, decisions are well supported. In order to verify, it's, it's very important that uh, through this uh, participation, we are able to verify, understand if the flows of information to the government bodies uh, are adequate. So it's very important, uh, in my opinion, during a crisis, uh, our role of, of advisor. On, on the other hand, uh, it is important also uh, our assurance role. And uh, so uh, through this uh, experience, uh, through this uh, Participa participation to the crisis management unit, we also must be able to 
decide to understand if, where, and when um, we have the necessity to carry out specific audit activities. Let me say that COVID has been, at, at this regard, a good preparation. Uh, and so during a, a crisis, uh, internal audit needs to be very, very agile, very flexible, and reactive, and play an important role to uh, assist government bodies in overseeing the impact of, uh, of the crisis, uh, in our case within the bank, but uh, let me say within our, our company. So um, we will uh, uh, now uh, face uh, this uh, this uh, uh, situation uh, through uh, three uh, main speakers. Let me introduce uh, um, each of them. Uh, this is a panel uh, of uh, uh, persons that who wrote uh, together with me. The, a paper uh, that uh, ECIIA then uh, finalized and uh, published uh, with regard to the role of internal audit uh, in uh, uh, during the, the Russian and Ukrainian cri crisis. The first speaker is uh, uh, Ross Richard. Uh, Ross has been uh, working with the internal audit and uh, security since 1996. He held the technology audit leadership roles uh, at the ING and uh, at Barclays before joining Nordea in 2008. His current uh, role at uh, Nordea is uh, um, uh, Chief Internal Auditor for Technology, Security and Change. Uh, Ross, uh, holds a Master of Sciences in, in Information uh, Security from Royal Holloway the, of the University of London. OK, Ross, welcome uh, with us. The second speaker will be Mauro Zanni. Mauro Zanni has a degree in uh, economics uh, from Bocconi University in, uh, in Milano. Uh, Mauro has uh, many experiences in uh, internal audit uh, in the banking sector, let me say above all in the, the international uh, at the international level. Um, his current role uh, at Intesa San Paolo is uh, executive director we, uh, responsible for uh, auditing foreign banks network and uh, wealth management and protection um, activity of the group. The last, uh, the third speaker is Paolo Nasi. Pa Paolo Nasi has uh, also a degree in uh, business administration and bank management from Bocconi University in Milano before joining uh, Inter San Paolo in uh, 2005. He had uh, um, many experiences, uh, above all in the Italian Security uh, Commission, CONSOB, and uh, then in, in risk management in the first Italian online bank, uh, where Paolo was the head of risk management. Uh, his current role at Intesa San Paolo is uh, uh, executive director um, responsible for corporate investment banking, uh, activities and market and liquidity risks uh, with regard to, to the group. So the panel is composed of a, a person with a long experience in, in banking, but let me say that uh, he, um, in my opinion, uh, uh, our experience in, in bank, our point of view uh, is very useful also for internal audit uh, from all the other industries. OK, so now um, we can start with, with uh, the, the first poll. Uh, and so following the instruction that Pascal uh, said uh, and going to slide, the first question for you is uh, based on your experience, uh, what is the most important risk for your company in the car current uh, crisis situation after three months, I would say four months at the moment. Uh, you can answer cyber risks, sanction risks, supply chain risks, 
reputational risks, inflation risks, business continuity. Um, okay, I can go on. Uh, supply chain risk, inflation risk, business model, business model risk, people safety, liquidity, market, uh, other. We we uh, we made a very long list of risks, and I am very curious to understand uh, what's your opinion. Okay, I don't uh, see uh, any longer the, the result, but uh, it, is, uh, it is clear that by far, Ross, the, the most important uh, risk for, uh, for us, for the attendees, is uh, the cyber risk, but it is very important as well that the second one is uh, related to sanctions. And uh, I saw the business uh, model risk. Uh, I, I don't remember if it is, it is the third or, or the fourth. Let me say that I, I am not surprised uh, with regard to um, to cyber. I am a little bit surprised about uh, uh, the, the so-called business model risk because, because in my opinion, uh, it uh, could be that uh, we are underestimated the, the implication of this crisis on our business model and the evolution of the business model for all the company, all the industries I, I am meaning in Europe. But I, I will uh, uh, ask uh, uh, later to Paolo to comment uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, result. So, uh, Ross, uh, um, we, we decided to have uh, three different sessions. Uh, the first one with regard to cyber risk, the second with regard to sanctions and the third to business model. And probably it was uh, the, the right choice that we made according to the, the answer that you, you, you gave us. And so, uh, Ross, cyber risk uh, are high on the list. Uh, there are many considerations that we pointed out uh, in uh, in our paper: uh, the separation of, of the of one country from the rest, uh, the increase of uh, monitoring, um, the increase of protection needs, uh, the importance to to know better our employees. And so the first question for you, uh, Ross, is what uh, have you seen in terms of cyber risks uh, evolution during the last four months? Yeah, I, I, actually, the answer is maybe a bit of a surprise. I would say surprisingly little. Um, <laughs> a lot of these risks which you mentioned have been around for quite some time, and they've arguably been at similar levels, but I think the war in Ukraine has focused minds on understanding them a lot better. Um, I think the likelihood aspect of some of the some of the risks has uh, is perceived as increasing for several area risks, particularly as a result of some of the political decisions that have been going on. You know, we've had the NATO accession discussions for Finland and Sweden, and associated with that, we've seen some activity. However, you could say in terms of materialization of the risks, there hasn't been anything too dramatic and touch wood on that. Um, this week, for example, we had some uh, denial of service attacks on Norway by a group called Killnet, which is pro-Russian and they had defaced some sites and they knocked over some uh, uh, service providers of some of the banks and also some of the social security assist systems. Um, and there have been similar attacks in other Nordic countries, but you know nothing with sustained impact. So these kill net attacks, they were prim primarily uh, denial of service attacks, 
And we've seen that in the past and we'll see that again. So there wasn't something, you know, really new. However, as with usual with cybersecurity, everything can change tomorrow. <laughs> um, or in fact, while we're having this discussion. So, uh, you know, it, it's really, really difficult. And I think the pandemic gave us a bit of pause for thought on preparing for the extreme events. You know, we often repeat that a few years ago, no one was preparing for a global pandemic. Now it's something everyone knows can happen. And I, I think it's a bit the same with cyber. So the experts understand the vulnerabilities and we may need to make sure that they are heard and that the government is in place to support this. However, I think the materialization of severe events in this space is very, very difficult to predict. And so it's somewhat the challenge that we've got is that until something very serious happens, it's quite difficult to justify the investment needed. Uh, but after something serious happens, it's too late. Clear, clear. It's, it is uh, it is very interesting uh, what you what you said. Uh, probably we are facing uh, a physical war on one end, but also a, a cyber war on the other end. And we don't know how things can go ahead in the in the near future. So, uh, Ross, uh, what measures, uh, in your opinion, can banks uh, or more in general our companies take uh, to mitigate the, the risks? So as, as mentioned, you know, many of the risks emerging out of the Ukraine war are not new. They are things that we've had before. And so the controls themselves are also the same, you know, make sure you understand where all your important information assets are, uh, whether they are sufficiently protected, including from things like denial of service attacks. Make sure you understand how you're connected to those assets too. So. Does your network go through conflict impacted countries? Do you have alternate routes? Are the links encrypted? But it's probably, you know, a lot about also dealing with the basic security hygiene. Scan your systems, patch them, scan your systems, patch them. It's it's the same over and over again. Um, and make sure that's also this is the case with your vendors. Uh, make sure your access rights are sensible. Make sure you know your supply chain and this whole security around the supply chain. Know who your employees are, who the insiders are. And test, 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 test your cyber incident response capabilities. And one of the areas I would really encourage you to, to do if, if, if possible in your institution is red teaming. Where you actually have someone, uh, you know, like a team that's acting as a hostile uh, uh, entity as if they are attacking your 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 company um, and staff that well um, and consider also you know for the internal audit whether the internal audit team cooperates with the red team because sometimes they can know some of the vulnerabilities in the bank um, that that really helps also the the rest of the bank prepare in terms of like are they able to respond quickly to this kind of kind of thing as if it's a real incident. Um, and then otherwise, I think, you know, making sure your all your staff are aware, just looking for things which seem suspicious and that they know very quickly how to escalate it. So um, have quite a low threshold for your staff in that. And, you know, this is a cultural thing. Make sure that they may be over reporting um, because Right now, we don't know where the next thing might hit or what might be hit. It could be anywhere. And so that awareness and sort of elevated um, uh, preparedness is, is key. And then the final thing is make sure that you have open communication lines to all the relevant government agencies. And that's both ways, getting information from them, but also providing information to them, telling them what you're seeing. Um, and then also with your PR organizations. So we have, for example, uh, tight relationships with our PR banks. When something starts hitting that, we know about them so that we can also see if it is. It's not something that we're competing with them on. 
and I, I really, really encourage you also to try and, and, and do that. Okay, okay, very clear. A lot of uh, useful suggestions from your experience. Uh, and the, so the, the last question for you, Ross, is uh, how do you see the, the evolution of cyber criminality in this context? Uh, similar to what I was saying before. Yeah. What do you for, foresee? Yeah, so, so criminals never seem to miss a good crisis. I mean, we see it over and over again, whether it's a humanitarian crisis, COVID, financial crisis, or in this case, war. And they will attempt to leverage for, for gain. And we've seen some scams already associated with the Ukraine war, for example, the usual charity scams where people pretend they're raising money or are pretend they're trying to escape from uh, Ukraine or whatever it is in order to fool people to give their banking details, credentials and that. So we see those. Um, but I think this time there is something which is different as well, which which we see emerging. Governments across Europe and probably across world are pumping huge amounts of money into investigation and development of cyber defense and attack capabilities. Now, what tends to happen when governments invest in something really, really heavily, eventually it trickles down into the rest of society. So these capabilities will trickle down probably eventually into the criminal hands as well. Um, and that means that, of course, we in all our in industry need to be aware that we need to be running very fast to keep up with this. And I say things will trickle down into criminals. You know, in some cases, the the sort of gap between the government and the criminals is very small. You know, the state sponsored criminal institutions in some countries. And of course, they will then directly be getting this state support to develop their capabilities. So that's, I think, the area that I'm most concerned about, that we'll see the criminals developing, you could say, the more advanced capabilities that are currently possessed by some of the states. But I think that we'll see those migrating also into the criminal organizations, unfortunately. OK, clear. Clear. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ross. Uh, I ask Paolo, for instance, if uh, Paolo, uh, what, do you want to 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 add something, uh, something else to what Ross said? Do you agree? Yes. Uh, I just want to underline uh, the fact that uh, it's very important for firms to. Uh, keep an adequate investment stream dedicated to the unknown threats. Uh, so uh, that's uh, quite important. And uh, also to uh, help uh, institution to early identify potential threats. It means to identify trustworthy cycle of experts and supplier. Uh, so cybersecurity is a field where cooperation with authorities and their rival peers it's quite uh, important that uh, what also uh, uh, Ross said before but I would like to underline the importance of this thank you Claudio. okay thank you Paolo and now we we go to the the second poll uh, we have a couple of questions let me see very simple but very tricky. What the first question is: What are the impacts uh, of the crisis on your organization? We are meaning not uh, uh, your company, uh, not not uh, the organization of internal audit for sure, but uh, in your opinion, the most important impact impacts uh, on your organization. This is uh, um, a, a, a growing level of uh, of impacts uh, uh, that we pointed out uh, as possible answers. Okay, 
let me say by far limited the impact in your experience mainly indirect with regard to cost, inflation and so on. Let me say that uh, I am a little bit surprised because uh, once again, my expectation is that uh, with regard to business model to be updated at least partially, it could be that probably our companies in Europe, we will have to think about uh, the evolution of business model uh, because probably world is changing and our business model must change as well. But uh, this is uh, your opinion, uh, um, different from uh, from my expectation. Uh, but in any case, it is important that the current year budget uh, has, has been substantially revised, uh, probably more, more due to um, the, the indirect uh, impact uh, as uh, explained in the first, uh, in the first question. A another question, uh, when do you think uh, the crisis will end? Soon, by the end of uh, this year, beyond 2022, or it will last years? OK, in this case, uh, it seems. Uh, very clear is not a, a, a positive uh, situation, but it, it is uh, exactly the same that uh, I, I think. Uh, we it uh, will not uh, finish by the end of this year, but uh, it will go ahead. And so the situation, the crisis uh, will uh, will go ahead and we have uh, at this point uh, to organize our, ourselves, uh, our organization in order to manage uh, a, a, a long term crisis. Hopefully without having another crisis uh, uh, to related to COVID in, uh, in next uh, winter. OK, so Mauro, uh, I, I come uh, to you. Uh, we have seen uh, that. Uh, uh, sanction risk is uh, the second risk uh, according to the attendees. And so. Uh, this uh, session is very useful in my opinion, as well as uh, the. the the one related to cyber risk. So Mauro, first of all, I ask you why and uh, in which way is important uh, to guarantee an effective and correct implementation of the sanctions uh, through the organization? OK, thank you, Claudio, and thank you, Pascal, for inviting us to this uh, meeting. It's a pleasure for me to be present. Uh, uh, regarding your four question, uh, how is important to ensure an effective and correct implementation of the international sanction? Uh, uh, I reply that it depends on, in my opinion, on two main drivers. First of all, uh, the complexity and the inter international and geographies of the group with the subsidiary located uh, in or close to countries subject to embargoes and uh, uh, sanction. The level of complexity of a group uh, depends also on the presence of subsidiary in this uh, location and uh, the level of which uh, the, uh, this is the other driver, the ICT solution are supported, the sanction is essential. We could have uh, a group with uh, uh, then this could be the best solution with a, a unique ICT platform to manage all the different type of sanction uh, or we could have uh, a group in which uh, we have uh, two uh, different platform one for the domestic uh, payments and the other for the international payment or 
the most complexity solution is uh, to uh, to uh, have uh, a group with a platform with different platform in different subsidiaries. So the first important point uh, to ensure a correct and effective implementation of the sanction is to assess the complexity of the group and to access the uh, capacity of the ICT system to manage correctly the different type of sanction. Here we have to say that starting from February, last February, we have seen six different wave of sanction that were issued at least uh, every week with the uh, sanction that are ranging from uh, uh, at the beginning to banks and the institutional. Uh, I, I remember the eight Russian banks that were sanctioned at the beginning, then the sanction moved to individuals, then the sanction moved to economic sector and to payment system. So a very huge and wide range of sanctions that were issued in uh, three uh, months and uh, the, uh, the forecast is that uh, the sanction will be increased in terms of uh, type and uh, number. Based on that is essential in my point of view, as I told you in advance, to assess the level of complexity of the group due to the geographical presence and the way of the system to manage the sanction. In this way, it's essential to assess the capacity of the main different system used for the name screening, the payment filtering, and the transaction monitoring in order to assess the ex-ante and exposed control on the sanction. Based on that, uh, I reply to your question, why is essential to, uh, to, uh, to uh, ensure a correct and uh, uh, effective implementation of the sanction? It's essential to prevent uh, reputational risk and to avoid sanction, uh, uh, risk of sanction by the authority that issued this international sanction. We have at least three different authorities, UK, US, and European authorities. We have uh, a, 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 an increasing interest on the ECB uh, to understand uh, how the banks uh, are able to manage such a wide range of sanctions. It's uh, important to mention that the ECB issued uh, an important paper on May 18 uh, of this year in which one of the three steps of the assessment made by DB, ECB is stated that ECB is building up knowledge on sanction and related compliance risk. So it's essential in order to prevent also, in my point of view, could, that could be thematic review or deep dive on this specific uh, uh, argument that each bank uh, assess independently the way in which uh, the three different international sanctions were applied in the group and in the head office. And uh, the, if the group is complex and presence in uh, different uh, geography, it's essential to ensure that uh, the application of the sanction is done in the correct way in all the location of the group, not only at head office level. OK, thank you, Mauro. And this, uh, let me say, this uh, big interest uh, from uh, the, the, the uh, supervisory authorities uh, is uh, means, uh, uh, in my opinion, above all, that uh, we have uh, a very important uh, reputational risk. Because if uh, we are not able to manage in the right way this uh, system, we could uh, we could have a significant impact in terms of uh, reputation uh, and, and so on. Uh, and so, Mauro, uh, what is the role uh, of the internal audit uh, to reduce uh, the sanction risks uh, and uh, how to collaborate uh, with the second line of defense? Uh, I would say, above all, with the compliance uh, and anti financial crime uh, unit within, uh, within the bank. Claudio, as you told at the advance, uh, we should uh, uh, use two different uh, uh, approach, the advisory and the assurance. We are now in uh, an extraordinary situation, as you 
told uh, at the beginning. Nobody was thinking uh, when uh, the budget was prepared for this year that uh, there could be a war in Europe. Now there are new emerging risks to be assessed uh, and to be under, uh, understood. Even if, uh, as it was told at the beginning of Ross, uh, as an example, the cyber risk was a risk already uh, perceived by each uh, counterparty, the relevance and the magnitude of the risk with this uh, crisis increase significantly. Due to that, what we can do, we could uh, support uh, as an advisory role the IFC and the compliance participating to the meeting in order to assess the new type of emerging risk in order to ensure that they set up an adequate framework to manage the international sanction. They provide adequate guidelines to the subsidiary in order to ensure that the sanction manager is correctly applied across the group in order to implement, and this is in my point of view, the most uh, sensitive point in order that uh, the sanction screening and filtering system are adequately implemented and to ensure, as you told you at the beginning, that the flow of information on the sanction management within the group is correct and timely managed. Uh, that's from uh, the advisory role. The other very important role is the insurance. We should uh, assess independently. Uh, so we should perform an audit on the sanction management process in order to verify that uh, the framework on the sanction is well defined the system are correctly implemented and timely implemented and in particular that the relevant alerts and cases are adequately managed and solved. In this, uh, in this uh, uh, situation, it's very important to independently test the uh, IT system that are managing the sanction in order to test and to reperform the agony and to verify that they are working perfect, uh, correctly and they are capturing exactly what it is expected. The other important test to do in this, uh, uh, in this uh, type of audit is to ensure that the data feeding is correct and complete. So all the transactions are correctly inputted in the filtering system in the uh, uh, tools used to manage uh, all the uh, sanction uh, filtering uh, related to the six different wave of sanction. This is not uh, an easy job because uh, as I told in advance, there were seven, uh, six uh, wave of sanction by three different authorities. Uh, I have to tell you that the IFC department during this uh, period have worked a lot and mainly on the management of the sanction, we should ensure to the board that what has been done uh, by the FC department is correct and complete. And we should validate the ICT system used by the group in order to prevent the group to have, as you told at the beginning, any reputational risk. Okay, thank you, Mauro. Let me let me add that uh, this kind of assurance, uh, specifically specifically related to the sanction uh, uh, process, uh, in our case has been uh, expressly requested by by the JST by ECB, and it is uh, a, a good example of uh, uh, audit activity to insert within uh, our plan in such uh, a situation. Uh, okay, thank you, Mauro. I, I ask uh, Ross uh, if you share the, the experience of Mauro according uh, also to uh, the country where, where you are based or if you have a, a specific other observation. Yeah, I, I very, very much share. I, I think, you know, we've had the huge challenge with the speed of change of sanctions and the, the teams actually dealing with implementing that. That's been really, really difficult. Also because some of the sanctions, it was not initially clear on scope and things like that. So trying to clarify them, trying to actually find out that that was a huge amount of work for the sanctions team. Um, 
I think the one other thing that I might highlight as well that we that we're seeing is, of course, the challenges for our customers also in understanding the sanctions. Um, and, you know, we obviously we border uh, Russia several places, and so there's very tight trade links and all sorts of things. So I think many of our customers have previously only had experience of financial crime prevention when we've asked them for their KYC <laughs> questions. But now they are having to themselves understand complex sanctions uh, things and um, also for example, trying to understand what is a dual use good, you know, for people who've worked with sanctions, it's quite normal. But for someone who has been, uh, I don't know, shipping fish around or shipping pipes around, that hasn't been something they've had to think about. And suddenly our customers also have to think about it. So we've also had to do quite a lot of work in helping our customers understand what are the implications for them of these sanctions. So that's maybe the one additional aspect. Okay, thank you, Ross. And now I come to to Paolo, and uh, uh, we go to the third session with regard to the risk model risk. Uh, Paolo, as we have seen, uh, it seems that uh, it it is not uh, uh, the business uh, model impact uh, uh, at uh, uh, the top of the list of uh, of the risks according to the attendees. Uh, uh, what are, in your opinion, the, the main impacts of, of the crisis on the business uh, and what about the supply chain impacts, uh, for instance, the credit loan impacts uh, and so on? Okay, Claudio, uh, let me thank you uh, and for the question. And also, I would like to thank uh, Pascal for having me here and all of you. Uh, it's uh, it's a sort of uh, a very uh, interesting exercise to to see what to answer to your question. Uh, I see two main impacts for the crisis. The first is uh, at uh, macro level on the global economy as a whole and the European economy uh, with uh, its short term and longer term effects on the geopolitical landscape. The second is the micro level impact on specific sectors and uh, business models that could be reshaped by the crisis. These models are present in many industries, also in the banking sector, as we know. Uh, as to the first aspect, uh, we should not overestimate the overall impact of the crisis because, uh, yes, it has full to prices increase uh, that started well before the crisis uh, with the uh, post-pandemic supply chain bottlenecks. But uh, uh, for sure, in terms of uh, risk, uh, it should be considered that, uh, especially in the new geopolitical scenario, uh, many things could uh, change in the longer term, let's say. Uh, for example, we see a decoupling of the economies from the West uh, and the East. Uh, and uh, I would say also that the ambitious ESG transition targets uh, will cost more and uh, will be uh, a, an issue uh, among emerging and developing countries from one side and the Western world on the other side. So the interest could diverge uh, a little bit. Uh, then there, there are, uh, so energy product shocks are expected to reduce the, UL, the, the EU growth by one percentage point and, uh, and on fourth, so and one fourth uh, in 2023. So not that huge impact, but for sure not, uh, not, not, uh, not, uh, uh, small, not light, not light. Yes, uh, and uh, the rise of the inflation is uh, uh, expected to add one percentage point uh, on the baseline uh, that is expected for next year. But there are uh, some uh, uh, unknowns, uh, especially about the concentration of Russian and also Ukraine products in the supply chain. 
that uh, will impact uh, the economy for sure. They are uh, uh, products that are in the early stage of the production cycle. For example, uh, nickel, one fourth of the nickel comes from uh, Russia and Ukraine and palladium is one fifth and both are particularly important in the greens transition, for example. Uh, so uh, these products uh, will need to be uh, uh, we need to be uh, to be able to find alternative supplier. In any case, it will be costly, and uh, and uh, we don't know if we will succeed in this. As to the second aspect, so the micro level uh, impacts, uh, we are forced to rely on a case by case approach and. Uh, must be ready to take strategic decisions uh, about uh, direct exposures. Uh, uh, so um, I think that uh, we have to treat here each each uh, a tailor-made approach, let's say, from each business uh, as to take into account his own uh, situation. Um, for the for the banks, uh, the indirect uh, exposures. Uh, must be uh, identified and uh, uh, business that are affected uh, by the crisis should be um, should be uh, treated with uh, a tailor, as I said, uh, a tailor made uh, approach, uh, evaluating uh, possible action like credit extensions and and so on and so forth. Uh, it was very clear clear also in the pandemics uh, that uh, it will be very useful in this occasion uh, to have uh, a detailed sectorial and geographical view in order to be able to assess risk and react with proper business initiatives to meet the specific client need. Okay, thank you. And, and what about our role? What could we do as internal auditor with regard to this uh, situation, to these possible impacts, uh, our role, our relationship uh, also with the, the other control function, especially the risk management, I am thinking. Well, I, I think that we can go back to your, uh, uh, your forward, let's say, words. Uh, most important, I think that uh, uh, internal audit uh, uh, think uh, uh, as a being responsible for the effectiveness of the whole internal control system and uh, uh, to play this role, uh, internal audit must be intelligent, let's say. That means uh, uh, not opinionated, uh, humble, to be humble, but well informed and uh, ready to discuss in depth the consequences of real world facts on the functioning of the whole organization. Um, I would say that uh, as to business risk, internal audit should be able to assure that the firm, uh, from its point of view, has properly identified new risks and their impacts that these risks uh, have been considered and properly managed by the relevant functions. And third, if these risks have consequences on their regulatory parameters and accounting records, uh, they have been properly evaluated and registered. The first uh, two steps must be performed as soon as possible, I would say. So, almost uh, in real time, because that is the most effective way to contribute to the mitigation uh, of underlying threats uh, for the firm. The third step, uh, it's uh, more traditional, but, but nonetheless uh, less important. Um, I think uh, one, one very important thing, and it was also underlined by the, by the slide of Paul, uh, it's uh, about the uh, reflection on the strategic plan and the budget. Uh, we have to be, uh, as internal audit, uh, involved in understanding if the consequences on the first strategy and business model have been considered, because the uh, uh, business plan should be uh, uh, 
updated if the, these consequences are significant and uh, uh, it must be uh, the new scenario embedded in a new version of the of the uh, plan and approved by the, the board. This is very important step also from a risk control point of view, because uh, if you do not realign managers uh, on feasible targets, uh, other risks uh, can emerge yeah. and also more severe, let's say. Um, to do this, uh, as I told before, as I said before, uh, the first requirement is to be informed and aware of of all the reasoning that occurs uh, within the firm and uh, be ready to monitor whether the all the all all the knowns have been properly considered and, and evaluated. Um, well, uh, as to the second point, uh, for example, initiatives about direct exposure with sanctioned counterparties or uh, business uh, that are under threat. Uh, these uh, uh, in initiatives must be coordinated and overseen uh, with compliance, ML, legal function, and these steps possible must be traceable, let's say. Uh, as to the third point, uh, that is uh, the ex post assurance, let's say, uh, the general approach should be uh, discussed and shared with other control functions. The earlier, the better, I would say. Um, internal should be independent in the extractions of the data and uh, checking uh, the completeness of the, 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 the data and the, the perimeter of the impacted uh, exposure, but it's important that uh, the general approach is shared. And uh, this is also something that uh, comes to an, an answer to, the, to your question about uh, the uh, interaction with risk management in general, uh, the other uh, internal control function. I, I think that uh, what must be avoided is uh, a vertical approach uh, and uh, the integration of the risk assessment phase and the coordination of the early action is very important to assure an effective uh, control system uh, reaction. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Uh, I would ask you a lot of things, but... Uh, and, uh, now I ask uh, um, to Pascale if uh, are there are questions uh, due to the fact that we have uh, eight minutes before we have to finish. OK, here we are. OK, so the first question. Uh, uh, I would ask uh, uh, Ross to Ross to answer what is the regulator expecting from internal audit in the context of, of the crisis, Ross or someone else of you? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess uh, it, it depends on the regulator. So the ECB, as an example, they've been uh, meeting with us very, very regularly. Uh, they want information from Nordea as soon as we can give it to them. Um, a little bit back to the early earlier thing is, you know, have these close connections to the authorities. The authorities are very close to us about what's happening. Um, I think that there has been maybe, you know, sort of some unexpected regulators popping up as well um, that we hadn't normally thought about, you know, that are dealing with, you know, some more safety uh, and security aspects, not financial regulators. So they start <laughs> having expectations as well. Um, and also, you know, may, maybe governments as well start seeing, OK, now there's strategic importance for the different large companies and the government start having uh, extra expectations on companies like banks. So the normal, yes, our normal banking regulations, they, they just want to know stuff even faster than before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then we've also seen, you could say, emerging other 
uh, other regulators also with expectations and you said government expectations as well. I don't know if that matches your experience. Yes, it, it matches. Let me say that uh, um, the expectation of regulator in our case is that we are able to uh, exactly to to have uh, quick answers to all uh, their needs. Uh, and uh, in our cases, we have discussed uh, with them about uh, um, about our also possible uh, audit uh, assurance activity to be to be carried out, uh, as I said before. I would uh, leave uh, um, Mauro uh, to answer the second questions. Question: What is the role, uh, Mauro, in your opinion, of internal audit uh, in terms of uh, assisting the board in reviewing the strategy? Paolo has said his uh, opinion and uh, is uh, is useful, Mauro, that you share your your uh, idea. Okay, thank you, Claudio. I think uh, that uh, it's important to understand the geographical complexity of the group, uh, to understand if there are subsidiary in the two countries uh, that are uh, involved uh, in uh, the uh, crisis, to understand uh, and to support the board in order to uh, assure that a capital plan for uh, this subsidiary is uh, uh, performed and and submit to see if it is the case uh, to uh, review the presence in some of these countries, in particular in Russia, and uh, to change, uh, if uh, necessary, the type of strategy moving from uh, a strategy based on large corporate exposure to a different strategy that uh, could create uh, many problems, may, less problems in the future and uh, could uh, have been uh, less impacted uh, in the long term. Because as it was said by Paolo at the beginning, this crisis will imply uh, long term impacts, not only short term impacts to all the group so it's important to assess which could be the main driver in the business plan that uh, could uh, be reached in order to be uh, more neutral and more independent uh, reducing the impact on this crisis at the group level and at subsidiary level in particular if a group has subsidiary in those countries. Okay, thank you, Mauro. I, I agree with you. Uh, let me uh, now go to the conclusions. Uh, I, I wrote down a, a lot of uh, notes while you, you were uh, speaking. Uh, and I, I try to, to summarize and to, to summarize, trying to, to, to give the possible takeaways. Uh, the the first takeaway is a uh, crisis is a uh, is now business as, as usual, let me say. And so flexibility is crucial for internal audit. Um, flexibility means that we, we must be able to, to change easily the, our annual audit plan. Uh, flexibility means that we must be able to have a permanent risk assessment on the evolution of uh, risks during the crisis. And as I said at the beginning, is is very crucial uh, in order to reach this uh, um, objective to uh, attending uh, the regularly the meetings of the uh, management uh, uh, crisis uh, uh, management unit. A second uh, takeaway. Um, uh, our role during the crisis is this, uh, let me say, this a, a, a key and good moment to, to, to demonstrate uh, the, the added value of our, of, uh, our function. Uh, and uh, through the assurance role, as we said, but uh, let me say, above all, probably during a crisis through our advisory role. Um, it's very important uh, in favor of, of top management of corporate bodies. Our um, advisory role 
because this is more effective during a, a crisis. A third takeaway uh, about cooperation with uh, the other assurance provider, uh, in particular with the other internal control function. Let me say that uh, these kind of situations are uh, once again a, a good opportunity to cooperate, to collaborate with the other internal control function. For sure, we, we, we have to maintain our independence, okay, but uh, we need to, to work with the, the other uh, internal control function in order to, to also to, to have uh, more updated information and to uh, compare uh, our um, uh, opinions with, uh, with theirs and, and so on. The uh, four point uh, of takeaway about the risks, we have said uh, that uh, there are many risks in this kind of crisis, but, but by far, the opinion of the participant is that the cyber risk is uh, the, the, at the top of the list. Uh, Ross gave us uh, many suggestions. Um, the awareness, the support uh, very, is very interesting. The support of the internal audit to the uh, IT security department uh, in order to check uh, uh, permanently um, the security of, uh, of, of our system and, and uh, let me say also the importance uh, of the investments uh, in uh, with regard to this kind of risk that uh, are unknown risks. A another important uh, um, uh, consideration uh, about risks is about sanctions. That is the second uh, uh, top in the list. Uh, Mauro explained, uh, suggested that uh, how is important uh, to manage the, the, the sanctions according to the complexity and the, the geographical distribution of, of the group. It's very important to carry out the assessment, uh, as Mauro said. Um, and let me say that, that with regard to both cyber and sanction risk, uh, I would add not uh, under-evaluate, underestimate uh, the reputational risk that uh, we could have uh, uh, if uh, something could uh, happen. Last but not least, in my opinion, uh, some consideration about uh, the business, the impact on the business model uh, of our companies. Uh, it is possible that the longer it will be the crisis, the more it will be possible that the impact on the business model of our companies will be serious, will be severe, and it is important to consider to reshape the business model. Internal audit can have a very important strategic role with the top manager, with the, the, the government bodies in order to sensibilize and to, to, um, to ask for uh, an a analysis of the, the impacts. Uh, what uh, do I mean? Some examples. There are countries where uh, we now are uh, making business that uh, in the near future could not uh, be, uh, where we could not have the same possibilities because uh, uh, we are, uh, not uh, any longer in a globalization uh, economy and, and we, we will have to manage and to think, rethink about the geography in the world where to make business uh, and uh, considering that uh, some areas will not uh, um, want that we uh, um, uh, make business with other kind of areas in the world and this uh, could uh, significantly impact uh, our business model. So, having said that, I thank uh, uh, all the uh, participants and speakers, and uh, um, uh, and I uh, have to invite, uh, as a ACIIA member of the um, um, banking uh, um, team, to invite you uh, to for the banking forum uh, on October uh, the 4th. It will uh, be managed in a virtual way. 
and uh, in, for sure in the next uh, uh, weeks uh, you will receive some more detail from ECIAA. So thank you uh, again and uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks and bye bye everybody.